Hartman. I'm with Energy Management Corporation. We supply the variable frequency drives that are up here at the head house. So what we're going to do today is go over the variable frequency drive. We'll start with the parts on the variable frequency drive and uh, make sure you understand the meaning of each of the parts that should be talking to you guys. And uh, then we will talk about the operation. We'll actually energize this and bring it back online. So the first thing to do is look at the cabinet here. Uh, and the first thing I notice is I've got kind of a dirty filter. Um, these are filtered drives, and uh, we have gone through a number of filter designs, but we've come to like this filter design the best. First of all, this is a very standard filter. You don't need to go out and find some special filters in a catalog. Uh, the second thing is it's pleated so you get better airflow. And thirdly, uh, you can't, it's hard to walk past here without noticing that the, uh, the filter is dirty. And with a lot of the, uh, the uh, <laughs> so I think I still got months left. Uh, so, you know, we hope that'll be uh, not out of sight, out of mind. But a lot of times you'll have louvers in front of this. People may not even realize there are filters. So this one, of course, should be replaced uh, when you start this into operation. You can replace it just like I did, just by lifting it out and dropping a new one in. Or you can simply lift it up here and drop it out the bottom, which is probably a little bit easier. It's a standard 12 inch by 12 inch, one inch leaded furnace filter. There are two rules to drives, all drives. If you want them to last and, uh, and not have problems, not get the trouble in the middle of the night, keep the drive cool and keep it clean. Those are the two main items. So keep the fans operating, keep the filter replaced then you're going to be in pretty good shape. Uh, going up here, we have a lockout mechanism. Now, this drive is locked out. According to Arc Flash rules, you can't open this drive while it's energized, while any part of it's energized, without uh, having your safety gear on, Arc Flash safety gear. So rules are a lot more stringent than they used to be. And so we have this one locked out at the motor control center. But you can't just lock it out here and open it. You really need to lock it out at the motor control center if you're going to get into it. Uh, this is the uh, parameter unit or the controller. And we'll go over the functionality of the controller in a few minutes when we energize it. You can actually see what it's doing. Uh, this is a, an advanced parameter unit. So you make two kinds. There's the basic and there's the advanced. One of the great things I like about this is simply the keypad. You have a full keypad. You don't have to do this up or down arrow thing. You have a full keypad to program it with and it's an advanced high functionality keypad. And Jason can probably show you a little bit later some of the ways of troubleshooting this like the help function. Over here we have your uh, controls and uh, You'll notice that these are heavy-duty industrial 22 millimeter devices. That's a standard in the industry. I'm sure you have these in stock at the university. Any 22 millimeter device will fit right in here. And we put these in addition to the keypad so that people don't have to have a lot of training. You can come out here, put power on, lights on. You don't have to have any training to know what that means. So we've got here power on light. Here's our VFD fault, and here is our external fault. So if the VFD is in fault, you take a look at which of these lights is on. If the VFD fault is on, then that means the variable frequency drive inside the cabinet is in some sort of a fault, and you will reset that fault with the keypad. If you have external fault, that means that it's an interlock outside the cabinet that's turning this off. It could be a smoke alarm or some sort of thing. So if you see that, you're going to have to get the interconnection diagrams and figure out what device outside this cabinet has locked this out. Here's a BFD run. I think pretty obvious what that does. And here's hand off and auto. So we have it in off now, it won't run. In auto, it runs on the building control system. And in hand, it will run off the programmer. So you can run it from the front of the unit. Our name tag up here that will give you the model number, the serial number, voltage, horsepower, and so on uh, for this particular drive. And down here we 
have our service sticker. So the service sticker will give you a number to call. You can call that 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, we have the largest stock of variable frequency products of anybody in the Aircraft West. And we'll have generally all the parts plus the drive in stock in our main office in downtown Salt Lake. We, this also shows you dates that it was serviced, so you will have some uh, idea of when it was serviced and a signature who did the service. So if you wonder about what was done in the last service, you can look at that service signature and the services performed, and you can actually call us. Uh, we also will help you with troubleshooting a lot of. Uh, Companies will have you call Milwaukee or New York or something to get troubleshooting. We try to service all of our stuff here in Salt Lake. So if you call this number, you're going to be getting somebody in Salt Lake uh, and not uh, in India. So we'll go ahead. We have this off now. And so we can uh, open this up. And let's start over here. Here's the back of our... Uh, of our pilot devices, and you can see that this is the back of the keypad. The keypad is hooked into the variable frequency drive with a communication cable, and so that's how we can communicate there. If you'd like, while you're troubleshooting, you can always unplug this, plug in your own cable, and use a handheld device. You can use a handheld device like this, or you could use a laptop. And we do have a laptop with software that will allow you to talk to the variable frequency drive. All uh, the rest of the devices are hooked in via the ladder logic diagram that Jason will be going over. And here's our fans. Now you've probably seen filters where you look at the filter and there's a little round circle of dust on the filter. That's what happens when the filters are mounted too close to the, to the fans because all of the air comes through the outside of this filter here. And so if it's mounted too close to the filter media, let's say filter the outside of the fan, if it's mounted too close to the filter media, you're just pulling through a little circle. What we do is give you a plenum. It's not a big plenum, but a little bit over an inch. And that plenum means that now you're going to pull air evenly through the entire filter, and you'll get full airflow. What's happening? <laughs> it does. Um, because the whole thing is taped evenly. Um, you also notice there's two fans. Uh, so we have redundancy on here. If you have one fan fail, then uh, this thing isn't going to shut down. But if one fan fails and you notice it in a service maintenance interval, then you do need to make sure and get that fan replaced. If you don't and the fan fails, then of course you're going to get that call when the drive is shut down because of lack of cooling. So these are very simple. They unplug right here. And uh, at certain maintenance intervals, at least once a year, we'd recommend that you come in and replace these. Now, in order to find out whether the filter's working, you can, uh, you're the filter man. Uh, in general, you're going to want to get some gear on and open up the cabinet because this fan needs to be on and this fan needs to be on. And in the larger drives over here, we'll have more. You know how many fans are in those, Jason? Four fans. There's four. So in addition, there are two fans up here. Now these are the fans on the VFD. It's also important that they work. Now fortunately, on this particular drive, because it's an advanced high function drive, it actually, when, the, the, when those fans turn, they send pulses back to the microcontroller. So if these fans stop turning, you actually get a fall on the drive. But uh, you've got two fans, one here and one here. Both. It's an excellent uh, videographer of lights for If you need to replace these, this is really difficult. You just put your thumb under there and pull that up. This comes out. The fans lift right out of there. And all you have to do is unplug the fan, drop a new one in and you're all set. Now, we're in the construction era here, but uh, you'll notice that the whole fan, the cabinet is filled with dust, and you got little metallic particles here. 
obviously we don't want those floating around on the microcontroller board and such. So these really should be vacuumed out and on your yearly service interval or however you guys do it, it's a good idea to come in here with a vacuum and vacuum anything that's out of there. You probably aren't going to find much in here if you keep the filters clean. But it's important that this, the airflow is from bottom to top and it's important to try to keep the dust out of here. Again, keep it cool and keep it clean. Now, this is the variable frequency drive. The variable frequency drive uh, came into uh, effect in the late 1980s. It's so, uh, an electrical terminology, fairly new device. These days they're in use everywhere and primarily the same energy, but they also give you better control. It takes uh, 208 volts, in this case, 208, 480 volts, excuse me. Wrong job. It's 480 volts in, and then it would deliver a, an adjustable voltage and an adjustable current out in order to run the motor. So if the motor's running at half speed, it would generally be at half voltage. So the voltage is roughly, uh, I emphasize roughly, proportional to the speed. Uh, they're a little bit more sophisticated than that. Right here is your control power transformer. You've got two fuses on the 480 volt side and one fuse on the 120 volt side. So, uh, you know, these are in, we've seen 100,000 of these things. It's a standard control power transformer. And then we've got three relays. These are isolation relays. This isn't in all drive cabinets, but again, this is kind of a heavy industrial cabinet. And these relays are there to isolate anything in the cabinet from impulses and surges and incorrect wiring on the outside. We had on another job on, uh, on a different uh, type of cabinet, somebody connected 120 volts where there should be five volts and boom, you know, blew everything up. So this is a great way of isolating things and kind of protecting you. Um, you'll have a light on there. So uh, if that particular relay function is on, you should be able to see the light and that's a very quick way to troubleshoot to know whether that relay is on or off. Up here is your circuit breaker. Uh, not much to say about that. Pretty much a standard circuit breaker. And of course, you can lock that out. Uh, this device here is not, wasn't supplied by us, that's supplied by Yamas, and uh, I suspect that is an indication of output current, so that whenever they see output current, they know that the drive is running. And uh, they added that, so that won't be on our drawings, but that will go directly to their system, and that's a pretty standard way that control people generally do things. Um, so we have one more thing left, actually, uh, yeah, one more thing, and that is the harmonic filter. Um, variable frequency drives typically have harmonic current distortion of about 100%. That means if you have 100 amps going into a drive, it's injecting another 100 amps of high frequency noise onto the power system. And uh, these days, the utilities are getting more and more concerned about harmonics, and so they're beginning to implement IEEE 519, which has some very stringent harmonic standards. Uh, the engineers who ordered this ordered it with a harmonic filter. Now this is called a passive filter, and it's a three-reactor filter. So generally there's two types of passive filters. One is a two-reactor and one is a three-reactor. The three-reactor is the more, uh, the more sophisticated, the, the better performing of the two. And if you just buy a standard passive filter, you're going to get a two-reactor filter. So this is kind of a premium filter. And it's composed of one reactor, a second reactor, a third reactor, and a capacitor. And in order to control our reactive power, we've also added this contactor. So this will take the 100% harmonics and reduce those 100% harmonics down to about 7, 8, 9, 10%, somewhere in that ratio, which is virtually clean power. If you can get under 15%, you're virtually clean power, and this is, is considerably below that. It's a very good performing filter. The way we do things is instead of handing you a box with a filter and letting you wire it in, we integrate the entire assembly and it's all factory tested and UL as an assembly. 
So we will run up to about 30 hertz without this capacitor installed. That keeps the capacitor off the system until the drive is up and running. And at 30 hertz, then this contactor will close and bring the capacitor in. And then the filter will begin to do its filter. Uh, at 30 hertz, you're just beginning to really see load on the fan. And so once you begin to see that load, then the filter will be cut in and begin to uh, to do its harmonic filtering, and this will be virtually, as I said, a clean power device. So that's the harmonic filter. We also have fuses down here. These fuses are not present on all drives, but the purpose of those fuses is to protect the capacitor. So if the capacitor blows, you'll lose those fuses, but hopefully your drive will continue to run. Okay. In, your air coming in comes in through these fans. This is a forced ventilated cabinet. The air exiting will be through these stamped exits here. And so uh, because the air is flowing in, it should keep this dirty clean as long as the dryer is running. Um, now we haven't gotten into the specifics of what each of those relays do uh, or how to actually run the drive, so that's uh, something we're going to do next. Do you have any questions before we get to that? Okay, this is Jason Larson. Uh, Jason designed this. He designed it, put it in AutoCAD, and then it was built to his design. So he's going to go through the control diagrams with you, and we'll energize the drive. We'll actually run it and show you how to push the buttons and uh, maybe a little bit about troubleshooting. Oh, one thing before I forget, this little card right here, that does not come with the drive. That is a LawnWorks card. So that was specified by the communication people. They, this drive will run on a communications interface. And they specified LawnWorks by Echelon, so we've added a LawnWorks card for their request. So the drive will function off of a LawnWorks communication interface. Jason, all yours. Any questions so far? Every drive that we build gets a set of drawings. They're AutoCAD drawings. They're uh, available through energy management. You just call us if you lose. If you lose them or uh, if they become destroyed, just give us a call and we'll replace them. Uh, you'll see that the first page has basically a diagram of the cabinet. It's pretty close to a uh, relative of what's in there. The electrical diagram goes through and shows you exactly how each component that uh, Craig just told you about relates to how it's wired in the cabinet. I don't know that I want to go into uh, teaching you how to read schematics. Some of you do, some of you don't. But uh, every piece that's uh, in this cabinet gets detailed on the drawing. The uh, uh, circuit breaker, line reactor, all three line reactors, capacitor, uh, relays, lights, the fans. VFD, all of the connections in the VFD, and all of the output connections for the terminal blocks. These connections are the ones that you're probably most worried about because those are the ones that are that go to your uh, system communications and your fault relays and your fault um, contacts coming back to drive shutting off the drive. Uh, any questions on the drawings? Where could they find those drawings? The drawings are all inside the cabinet. They're inside, uh, usually on the side. Is there a troubleshooting guide that will be left in the VFDs that uh, we can look for fault codes and things like that? Or... Uh, troubleshooting guides are in the VFD. The VFD will have the VFD. User manual has it. That's all online at energymanagement.com. 
be in the O&M manual. Yeah, that's right. It will also be in the O&M manual.
right now we don't have any of those indications, but you move the you move the flashing arrow up and down with your up and down arrows. Find the topic you want and press the uh, read button to enter those topics. Right now it's just reading what the output is because I pressed There's no problem. Back to the monitor. Now, as this system's running, whether it's in auto or hand, there's another screen. This is your this is your home screen. Your home screen is your If you push the shift button, you can shift through different screens of monitor. Press it once and you get uh, amperage or current. Press it again, you get your voltage output. Your alarm history, you can read all of the alarms, at, uh, up to 10 alarms at a store. And others, The screen for others, and others has a, a whole list of things you can monitor or uh, look up. RPM, shaft torque, DC link voltage, uh, thermal overload, how much hertz. Uh, 15 and 16 are the IP signal and OP signal, the input and output signal uh, terminal, and you can actually read which ones are on and which ones are off. So you don't really need to get to the maintenance guy to find out what's being triggered in this drive. Right now we've got a start command and uh, I'll just uh, AU and CS, which are our post to stop, and uh, 421 input signal, which these two will always be lit because they're hardwired in. And the start command is on because there's a start command coming from the main. Well, those are the inputs. There's any outputs right now, but should be. It's all run. Run an SU. It's also run is functioning and up to the frequency is activated on the output. Any questions? Did I miss anything? Uh, just one more thing. You, you know, if I'm you guys and I'm standing back here watching somebody demonstrate something for 10 minutes, I'm not going to really feel very comfortable at it. Um, if you are interested, we do have an eight hour class on these, and it goes for the, what's the price again for this? Free. FRE. And we will bring you these drives out to demo, of course and let you actually program them and go through all the theory and everything. So uh, if you're interested in that, by the end of that class, then, you know, programming these things is a piece of cake. So uh, we do want for that. That's all. And I'm just showing you these presentations. This is part of our eight-hour training. We start with uh, motor theory over here, and that's with emphasis on VFDs. You need to understand motors, really, before you can understand what VFDs do. Then we get into VFD theory and go in quite a lot of detail over variable frequency drive theory. We get into variable the why they save energy. We talk about how solid state soft starts differ from VFDs. And then we have a very in-depth uh, training on harmonics. And then what's not here, of course, is the hands-on. We bring the demos 
and let you do the hands-on. So this is going to be a very brief overview uh, of just a few things that we think are probably the most important that we can get through in half an hour or so uh, from the VFD theory portion of this course. Should I stand up or? You're fine. All right. Uh, we won't be going through this whole course, just through a portion of it. So uh, let's skip some of these uh, first beginnings. Here is a variable frequency drive. I like to think of variable frequency drives in terms of plumbing. Now, I'm an electrical engineer and done master stuff and so on, but I still think even uh, for electrical engineers, the plumbing analogies are quite good. So, right here is a check valve that's electrically called the diode, but it works just like a check valve in a plumbing system. So, we have three phase AC right here, and the three phase AC is pretty much the standard throughout the world. Um, and you'll notice that it has three phases all displaced by 120 degrees, and each of those phases is a sine wave. Anytime any of those is the most positive, it, this check valve will open and let it through. So if you look at this blue wave here, whenever that's mo more positive than any of the others, that's A phase, so the A phase diode or check valve will open and let that through. When we get to this point right here, B phase becomes more positive than A phase, and A phase will close and B phase will open. And so we get kind of a choppy DC. The negatives are controlled by these three diodes and the positive by this, and we get this right here. So you'll notice that the positive ends up being the positive portions of those sine waves. The negative, minus this smudge in the middle here, is the uh, negative portions of those sine waves. Now if I take my voltmeter and I put my the negative or the black lead on the negative, which is the negative part of the DC bus, N, and put the positive lead, the red lead, on P, the positive start of the bus. Uh, excuse me. All right, so this is negative. That's positive. There. There is a terminal on the drive, one called N, that's connected here. There's a terminal on the drive called P, that's connected here. If you look at those, you're going to see this. Now you'll notice that I've changed the scale. So this is 580 volts, that's 680 volts of drive with uh, this, which is called a full wave, uh, naturally commutated diode bridge converter. Uh, we'll give you a waveform that looks like that. It's basically 580 volts DC with about 100 volts of AC riding on top of it. Well, we like the DC, but we need to get rid of the AC. So how do we get rid of the AC? Well, we use a reservoir plumbing reservoir and electrically okay uh, so this is the symbol for a capacitor basically it operates just like a reservoir you can put pulses of water into the reservoir but the level of the reservoir isn't going to change and so we get very good voltage if you have 40 volt input you're going to measure approximately 650 volts DC this is going to vary depending upon your incoming voltage and your load and it will vary based on the harmonic filter that you have installed. So, uh, but 650 is approximate. And because this reservoir is so good at filtering out that AC, you're going to get that voltage very steady. In fact, you're going to have less than 3 volts of AC ripple. Um, now, this is a pre-charged circuit. And uh, that just, it, it, it doesn't actually do anything when the drive is running. But when you first energize it, this gives you a soft charging of the capacitor until it comes up. So we'll now take that out because we're trying to understand the basics of theory. And so now you have your uh, six output switches. Now these switches, of course, in real drives are transistors, but I've shown them as switches because that is their function, is to act as switches. 
So if we turn this on, A phase becomes positive. If we turn this switch on, A phase becomes negative. And therefore, I can get a wave shape that's like this. Now the, the uh, blue is a sine wave. You don't get a sine wave out of variable frequency drive. Even if you have a drive that clearly says on the cover, sine wave, it's not, it does not put out a sine wave. Um, it puts out this little brown uh, wave shape. That's 40 volts and 60 hertz. Now, if we want to go to 30 hertz, we not only have to drop the frequency, but we also have to drop the voltage. So we use what's called pulse width modulation because we don't have any other voltage. We only have 650 volts, and therefore, we're going to just turn it on in short pulses. I think of this like in a plumbing system. If you have a monkey with a valve, he could just be turning the valve on and off, and he could control your pressure. Not very practical in a plumbing system, but works very well in an electrical system because transistors can turn on and off quickly, and they do a great job. So even though the tops of these pulses are still 650 volts, the average is only 240. The blue is a sine wave. That's only for you to compare it with. You're not going to see that sine wave on the output of a drive. What you will see is the pulses. If we need to go to 10 hertz, then you can see that the, we still have the 650 volt pulses, but they're spaced further apart and they're thinner. So if you're looking at an oscilloscope tracing, what you're going to see is these pulses, and that's okay. What is the best way to measure the output voltage on a drive? The very best way is to look on the keypad. Um, meters do a sometimes passable, sometimes terrible job of measuring the output voltage. So don't necessarily expect you can put your meter on the output of a drive and have it very accurate. The best thing to do is look on the drive and see what the output voltage is, and the voltage will reduce as the frequency reduces. This is a computer simulation, and that's the way the first drives function. But this is an actual output waveform of the drives that you have. And this is at 1 kilohertz, but very light and low, and basically an unloaded motor. The dark blue is your voltage, and the light blue is your current. You see that current's kind of choppy, but that is what you're going to see if you put an oscilloscope on the output of these drives. And uh, you'll notice that the pulses are wider here in the middle where we want the sine wave and narrower towards the edges. Um, let's now look at the full cycle. This one is at light load. This one is at full load. So you'll notice at full load, now we start seeing that current sine wave. This is the current, and the choppy pulsed are the voltage waveforms. Uh, this is 1 kilohertz carrier frequency. What is carrier frequency? Well, let's go back and look at this. The output frequency is 10 hertz. That means this is 1, and you'll see 10 of these uh, sine waves in a, um, in a second. But you also have these little pulses, and you'll notice that there's 6 pulses here, 6 pulses here, so there's 12 pulses in each cycle. And therefore, 10 times 12 gives us 120 pulses per second. So if we're looking at the output of the oscilloscope, we would see 120 pulses every second. Real drives operate much quicker, in this case, 1,000 pulses per second. And uh, we can set that. Let's change the pulses per second, or the carrier frequency, or the PWM frequency, to 5 kilohertz. In that case, the wave shapes look like this. Let's change it to 10 kilohertz. In that case, the wave shapes look like this. Now these drives are settable from anywhere from 700 hertz to 14 and a half kilohertz. We strongly urge you not to set them high. It may look like uh, this is a better wave shape than this is. But in fact, the drives are set at two kilohertz, and the only reason that you should set them any higher than that is if they're in an area where you can actually hear the carrier frequency and it's a bothersome from a noise point of view. Because the faster the the carrier frequency, the more acoustic noise you get. And you recognize all drives make that drive whine. But there are other disadvantages to high PWM frequency, and here are some of them. So we don't have time today to go over all of these uh, disadvantages, but clearly 
there is a disadvantage uh, to going high carrier frequency. One of the main ones is the higher the carrier frequency, the hotter the drive is going to run. And we've already mentioned that the secret to long life for drives is keep them cool and keep them clean. Now this is a drive from 1987. The reason I have this in here is because it's easy to see the parts. Here's your AC power input. Here's the diodes that we talked about. The diodes go over to the, the, uh, the capacitors, which smooth out that current. Then they go over here. These are the output transistors, which, tra which turn the thing on and off. And then they come out. Now this is 1987, but basically all drives in, 19, in 2012 operate exactly the same as this one did in 1987. Now there is a difference between a Volkswagen and a Chevy, Nova, and a Mercedes, but they all have internal combustion engines. There's a difference in how powerful they are. There may be a difference in quality of construction, in how easy they are to repair in how the parts are sized, but they all have the internal combustion engine that all operates the same way. Likewise today, there are differences in the way drives are built, but they all have these same basic parts. Because drives today uh, look more like this, uh, it's harder to see those parts because they're more compact, and that's why I use the 1987 drive. This is basically the drive that you have, and this is a 2012 edition of this thing, and uh, you can see that it has two high-speed processors in here. Those are very high-speed digital signal processors, which are uh, specific microprocessors meant for operating variable frequency drive. And the, you'll notice the board here is, uh, what, about uh, three inches by four or five inches? Does that sound right, Jason? There's a circuit board? Yeah, yeah. Something right. like that. Uh, but the parts, are basically the way this works is the same as it was in 1987. The processors are more powerful, the transistors are better, and so on, but they still operate in basically that same function as they did in 1987. Not only does this drive operate that way, but all drives operate that way. Now here, you've already seen from upstairs the, very, the basic parts of the drive. This is a passively ventilated or convection cooled drive and this is the drive with the filter on. I won't go over the parts much here because uh, we've already gone through that up there, but you can see the parts labeled here. This three contactor bypass does not exist because the drives you have do not have bypass, but other than that, and your drives have a three reactor filter, whereas this is just a two reactor filter, so you have a better filter than, uh, than this particular one. But otherwise, a fairly standard drive. Um, and there's our cabinet. These show some, uh, some bigger drives and it shows how the, uh, the drive increases in uh, the parts increase in size as you get bigger. Um, these are some custom cabinets that are available and uh, I'm going to go over here as you get into bigger drives, particularly outdoor drives, then uh, they get more protection and hoods. And but I'm not going to go over these because uh, it's not what you have and what we're interested in today. Now this has to do with motor peak voltages and DVD-T. Um, if you have over 100 feet between the drive and the motor, we recommend that you look at the DVD-T phenomenon. I'm not going to go over that in detail today, except to note that you get these pulses, and in some cases the pulses can go high enough to actually damage the motor insulation. Uh, the Mitsubishi drive what, that you have has soft PWM. Soft PWM is a proprietary uh, control method and with the soft PWM it does two things. The first thing that we can see here is you can go up to, if your motor's uh, one horsepower and above, you can go up to 300 meters. If it's three horsepower and above, you can go up to 500 meters. So you can go about 1600 feet. Uh, if you have this technology without worrying about those peak voltages. Um, but that's only with this particular drive. The second thing that I think is very exciting is the soft PDM was developed to decrease the noise level. Variable frequency drives tend to have an annoying metallic hum to them. And the metallic hum is at the carrier frequency. So this graph here is without the soft PDM control and this is an acoustic measurement 
that shows the four kilohertz frequency and shows the noise level. So we're looking at DBAs here. If you put in the soft PWM, you'll notice that it changes the character of that noise by not just switching at four kilohertz, but actually changing that in a complex waveform that, that varies the carrier frequency. And you can see that it is much quieter. So we found with this drive and with soft PWM enabled, which it is on these drives, uh, they are much quieter than a typical drive, and thus there's less need to set the carrier frequency high. So we like to keep the carrier frequency at 2 kilohertz uh, approximately, and that keeps your heat low. Um, all right, I'd like to talk about uh, bearings. And uh, the bearings, uh, we hope you don't have any of these situations, but uh, if you do, we want you to know what to do about it. This could occur with any variable frequency drive. This is the great invention of Nikola Tesla, three-phase power. We're used to this these days, but in fact, it was the most profitable, greatest invention in the history of mankind. And one of the wonderful things about it is that A phase A, phase B, and phase C always add up to zero. At any point, they always add up to zero, and therefore you don't have any what we call common mode voltage. Now, common mode, vo mode voltage ends up between the stator and the rotor. Well, what's between the stator and the rotor? The bearings. And so the bearings with a variable frequency drive see these pulses. And because of the way the pulses come out, there simply is no way to get the three phases to add up to zero. It's not physically possible. So all drives will produce some common mode voltage uh, produced by these pulses. What does that common mode voltage do? It impinges upon the bearings. So here's our shaft, here's our outer race, and that voltage will gradually build up voltage until it arcs through the oil, through the bearing, through the oil on the other side, and at that point you've sent a little arc through your bearing. As you might guess, that's a bad thing. Um, this is some uh, measurements that we can actually take. This is a special, you need a 200 megahertz scope or higher to do this. And this is a very special probe because it actually it has to ride on this rotating rotor. So with the motor running, we put one lead to ground, we put this on the rotor, and you will measure the actual voltage between the, uh, the stator and the rotor. Um, here's the voltage. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I don't know. It depends upon whether it actually causes a current to go through the motor. Well, how do we know that? We know it by looking at the current waveforms. You see that the voltage rises uh, gradually here, then right here, boom, it just drops suddenly. This sudden drop, the overshoot and the recovery, is the signature that indicates that we've just had a flash of current go through that bearing. So if we measure this and we see the currents go through the bearings, we know that they have damage, and we're going to see this kind of damage. This is bearing fluting, and it's on the outer race. It's also in the inner race. You can also see it on the balls themselves. If you compare a new bearing with a bearing that has had bearing damage due to fluting, then you will see that it loses that shine, and it's got a, a much more dull, matted appearance. If we amplify that, you can see that this is called bearing pitting damage, this is bearing fluting damage, but they all look kind of like this as you magnify them, and if you magnify them more, you can see why that's not a good thing for your motor bearing. That's going to cause the bearing to run hot, going to cause vibration, and eventually going to cause a bearing failure. So, if you're bearing, you've already got your motors here, you've already got your drives here, and most motors do not have uh, any uh, fix for this because it tends to be fairly expensive and very few people do it. But, uh, and if your motors continue to run and don't have problems, then not an issue. If somehow you begin to have problems on your motors, then we would encourage you to send them to a motor shop who is able to do this type of analysis. They'll cut the bearing in half, they'll inspect it, and they can tell then where the, the damage is due to VFD uh, uh, current damage because of the pitting. Now there are several ways to fix that. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these due to time, but I've got this one which is a full ceramic bearing and this one which is a ceramic coated bearing. 
Uh, if you put those in, then they basically insulate the bearing, and thus the currents can't go through the bearing, and therefore they can't damage the bearing. What's the problem with these? A lot of money. <laughs> they're very expensive, and you really, most people just don't feel like they're a justifiable cost in a new installation. But in an installation where you've already seen that you have problems and damage, then a motor rewind, you may feel that that's worth the cost to go ahead and put one of these in. Another option that we have that tends to be uh, gaining in popularity is this one. It's uh, produced by only one manufacturer, Aegis. These are carbon fibers. And the carbon fibers are the same fibers that you see on your copy machine. When you see the paper come out of the copy machine, there's a little brush with black thread-like fibers on there, and they brush against the paper that discharges the static electricity on the paper. Well, they now make these bearings and I'll show you this is what one would look like mounted on the motor so the bearing is actually attached to the frame of the motor so this is at the motor potential and then you've got these little carbon fibers that actually touch the motor shaft and the purpose of those of course they're conductive they want to make the little currents go through the brush rather than through the bearing these can be added on in the field or when you rewind a motor either one and they tend to work very well they're less expensive than the ceramic bearings and do a very good job. So as that voltage increases, it will just tend to get uh, shunted through this motor bearing brush and thus we protect the bearing. The brushes come in a variety of uh, mounting methods here and, uh, so, and you, can, uh, uh, you can glue them on if you have this conductive epoxy. If you want, to, as you get into bigger motors, we also suggest putting a little ring of silver colloidal shaft coating around the shaft to make the shaft more conductive where the bearing brush touches it. This is uh, a diagram of the motor. Here is your brush, and that protects this bearing, this bearing, and the driven equipment bearing. If you have motors over 100 horsepower, then he just recommends you use an insulated bearing on one side and the uh, grounding brush on the other. Now, this is uh, some pictures of our facility where the drives were built. This is a pictures of our repair facility. We also repair drives here in Salt Lake. And that's a picture from 1987, a long time ago. We have about 10 times that much in drive stock these days, but nobody seems to want to drag it out to the parking lot for a picture. Uh, so I'd like to show you a short video now. Okay, this is a short video. We took one of the grounding brushes that you saw, and we actually hooked it up to the motor, but we isolated it from the motor with a little switch so that we could turn it on and off and see what real effect this grounding brush had on the motor. And we were uh, quite pleasantly surprised by how well this works. So I'd like to show you this very short video. It's a minute and 36 seconds. drives on AC motors and converters on DC motors can generate damaging electrical voltages on the motor shaft. Once these voltages exceed the resistance of the bearing lubricant, they discharge through the motor's bearings, causing fusion craters, severe pitting, fluting damage, excessive bearing noise, and eventually bearing and motor failure. Energy Management Corporation has a solution. The bearing protection ring prevents electrical bearing damage by safely channeling harmful shaft voltages away from the bearing to ground. This technology can dramatically extend motor line. When the motor protection ring is activated, the electrical voltage is directed to ground through the brush, not the bearing, and the harmful shaft voltage spikes are eliminated. When the ring is deactivated, the voltage spikes increase and pass through the bearings from the shaft to ground diminishing the life of the bearings and motor and increasing maintenance costs. Motors and Drive International Motors offers a solution to harmful electrical voltage spikes on the motor shaft. The life of the motor is maximized and maintenance costs and downtime are greatly reduced. All right, so uh, that, was, uh, that was interesting when we actually saw the, uh, the waveforms from this at how good the grinding brush really works. So that's pretty much it. Again, uh, we offer this eight-hour class if you're interested. 
uh, please let us know and we can go through this in a tremendous amount of detail. We also have support. The number is on the drives and Jason may be the guy that you would actually talk to. We have a number of people who can offer that support and we do all of our support here in Salt Lake. Uh, you won't end up with an 800 number somewhere. So uh, that's it and thank you for, this is a great product. We hope it will give you a long life.